Hey guys, and welcome to the Talk of Fame podcast. I'm your host, Kai Montigny, and I am so happy to introduce you to David Edward, who served as a special agent in U.S. Army in the 1980s and 90s, and is a veteran of multiple overseas combat tours. He was also a special agent in charge of the 1990 Panama Canal quarter terrorism that threat assessment report to the U.S. Congress. He's a United States Army Intelligence School graduate, is graduate where he studied advanced human well, human intelligence in the battlefield court intelligence, also competing training at the Jungle Operations Training Center in Panama, Central America. He holds advanced degrees in engineering, including a doctorate in engineering, three related MSc degrees. Um an undergrad degree in business. Um, he's also currently the director of the Institute for Advanced Christian Research and is the author of over 50 books, which is seriously insane. But his best-selling thriller, Panama Red, which has sold over 250,000 copies and is based on true events in his life and chronicles U.S. military activities and knowledge as 1980 dictatorship it exposes the early stages of child trafficking crisis we face today. David, it is such an honor to have you on the podcast today. Thank you so much for taking the time. I apologize for such a long intro. Kylie, it's just it's great to just have you read that whole thing. Holy cow, that's that was that was a mouthful. Who wrote that nonsense? <laughs> I was actually one of those things. I'm kidding. But um, like, like I know like you did like some training at the operations center in Panama, Central America. Like what was kind of like the training like at the training center? Well, well, yeah, it's, an, it's an interesting question. Yeah, we're taking me back to my youth, right? Because we were just talking and this is a little while ago now, the 1980s and, and 1990s. Um, but yeah, so basically they had this thing. It, it's become what they call the Jungle Operations Warfare Training Center. I went before it was the war for a training center it was just like a survival school uh so this it was pretty cool i was stationed in panama and this is before we invaded i don't know if you remember but the united states uh actually invaded panama in, in december of 1989 and i was there a couple years before that and that was there through the uh through the invasion but the the the, the what you learn how to do is pretty neat is it's a two-week course that's all that's all how long it is and uh you learn how to survive in the jungle basically uh, and the, the most interesting thing that you have to do, and they wait till the end, is you, know, you have to learn how do you get water, how do you eat, all that stuff. And at the very end, they bring in like this huge 15-foot python. They cut its head off with a, a machete, and you have to drink the blood uh, to graduate. That's like, the, and, and they make it last, right? Because who wants to do that? Um, but uh, but I did it. Uh, everyone did it. You know, they they had to. And the jungle, have you ever been in the jungle? I don't I don't know if, if that's something that you've I done never like. did, but I always no. wanted to though. Like I seen of course pictures, but I've never been inside like an actual like, type of like jungle type of thing. Yeah. It's pretty awful. <laughs> it's, really? you know, everything everything in it wants to kill you or eat you or 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 be a problem. And the this school is interesting because you, you really the and, and I, I read about it and I kind of knew what I was walking into, but you're never inside. The whole course is, is taught in the jungle. And from the first uh, moment of the course, you're in the jungle. And what happens is if you get wet on the first day, then you're pretty much wet for the whole time that you're there. And, and that happened to me. I got I put my boots in water. I didn't know. I, that's the whole point of that's what you're learning. And it's miserable. And then my feet and socks were wet, you know, the whole two weeks, which is just just awful. Um, but it, it's a grueling um it was a grueling course. And the last thing they do uh, before you have to drink the snake blood is they they uh, helicopter you into the actual real jungle and you have a map and a compass and you got three days to find your way out. So you really do learn um, how to survive. And I used it. I then af after that, I took a vacation. I guess we call it a vacation. And I went to the Dorian Gap, which is it's uh, southern Panama. And it's, it, it includes the border between Panama and Colombia. It's some of the densest, almost awfulest jungle in the world, uh, but I saw some really cool things. I mean, there's like petroglyphs on um, big boulders and streams. I mean, dozens of miles into the jungle and just all kinds of fascinating things. I stayed, there's a group of people there called uh, the Wargandi uh, and they, I stayed at their village for two nights um, and uh, all kinds of just really cool stuff, you know, because I knew how to survive in the jungle, I was then able to, to go do. Ooh, that sounds interesting. Like, did you able to get through that, the jungle in three days or were you, were you able to? Oh yeah, I found my way. I'm here. I made it. <laughs> I, I made it out. Um, it took it took all three. It, it's hard. So the big thing you have to learn how to do is uh, navigate 
by you know looking because you have a map but this is before gps you know this is before any of this you literally have a piece of paper with a drawing on it that's the mm -hmm. map and then you have to be able to kind of coordinate where you are based upon the peaks and the heights and and uh the sun and all that stuff and then you kind of find your way out so i found my way out i, I was okay at it um I wouldn't do it. I wouldn't want to do it again, but I'm very glad that I did it. If that, if that Ooh. makes sense. Yeah. Like how long were you in Panama for? Were you just there for the two week training or were you there for a couple of years? Like, no, like I was stationed there. I was there for about a little over three years. Um, so I got there and there's a whole history and I write about, I use this backstory in some of my books because they, uh, the, the main books, Panama Red takes place at the same time historically that I was there. Um, and they had in May of 89, they had an election um, that just went completely south and Noyega canceled it. And they, the guy who, uh, I forget his name, who was running against Noyega's candidate, uh, they thought had won, uh, but then he pulled up thugs and they beat him. And there's a famous Time Magazine photo where the guy's, you know, beaten bloody and stuff. So it was kind of a mess. Noyega, what he was doing, and this kind of leads into some of the other questions you might uh, have, because I secretly have seen the questions that you're going to ask me. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, is uh, he, Noriega had, he had been a CIA asset, we'll call it. So he'd been trained by the CIA and he was friendly to the CIA. But when he kind of took over Panama in the late eighties, what he was just, what he decided he wanted to do was turn Panama kind of into the Switzerland of the, of the, you know, Central America, the, a banking hub. And then he partnered with um, Pablo Escobar, who was running you know, drugs and cocaine uh, into the U S and mm -hmm. uh, the big thing, you know, it's hard to think back to those times it was, it was before there was any digital currency. And Pablo Escobar, I think I think he was making like $70 million a day in cash or something oh, like that. Wow. But it's cash. It's literal physical cash money. Um, so just the logistics of moving that around were becoming impossible. So Noriega had kind of uh, become friendly with him, and he was trying to put a banking infrastructure in place that he could run as a shell to help Escobar, you know, with his business. And, of course, Noriega would get a cut and all that stuff um so it was really interesting times uh and i i when i got sent down there i had no idea what i was kind of walking into um but i wound up being part of you know some very pivotal events in history which which were interesting mm -hmm. 100 like that's actually insane 70 million dollars a day like that's something i hope to make in a year like i'm serious like, that's <laughs> well, actually if crazy. you can make 70 million dollars in a year i will be your biggest fan uh, that that good for you that that's a good goal that's that's a re that's a reasonable goal good for you seriously like if i made 70 million dollars a year i literally would be the happiest person on earth i don't really retire at 16 years old i'm serious I was, well yeah you don't have to have too many good years right for, the, for exactly. that to for that to yeah no that's good that's good yeah. maybe maybe this podcast will get enough views so that uh um you can start making that oh for those cross let's hope for that <laughs> but, yeah, all right, all right. but um in what ways, like, do you think, like, special? I know like, you were a special agent for a couple of years for different organizations in the military and everything. Like, how do you think, like, special agents what kind of change in the U.S. Army or in general over the course of the next couple of years? It's actually a good question. When I read that question, I was like, well, that's 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 interesting. Because when when I was in and the training I went through, and then uh, I was a field agent, so I was out in the field. It was kind of cool because I was enlisted, so I was very low ranking. But I didn't have to wear a uniform. I, I wore a suit and I had a badge and, you know, the whole thing. Um, and we were very much um, you know, autonomous would not be the right word, but we had a lot of latitude in what we could do, uh, the leads we could develop. And, and uh, we, 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 weren't, we did not have latitude in our cases. We would develop evidence and then the case, it would go up the chain. It would be approved as a case or not. But beyond that, we, we had a lot of we, we could pretty much do whatever we thought was right based on the rules. Um, they've, they've changed and I, my MOS was called 97 Bravo, which they still have, but they've created another one called like 35 echo, or I don't know what it is. Some, some other one that's also a counterintelligence agent. And they've really restricted and pulled back, um, what that role does now in the military, um, and counterintelligence, the, the, the mission of a counterintelligence agent is we were, uh, worried about something called, uh, SAIDA, uh, which is an acronym, which is subversion and espionage, espionage directed against the United States army. And our job was to go out and flush that out. But basically, and at, and at the time, although it, it shows you that uh, what's old is new again, at the time we were trained to fight the, the Soviets, the Russians, because mm -hmm. they were our enemies in the 80s. Now they yeah. fell, I think they fell like in uh, right around 89, right around the time we invaded uh, Panama. Um, but the counterintelligence agent, what they do is they look back on, on our forces, on the U.S. forces, and they see what we can figure out that we're doing. Because if we can figure it out by watching us, then our enemies can figure it out. 
Um, yeah. So that, that was part of the mission. And then the other part of the mission was if uh, if you have uh, a mole or you have someone who's been turned and who's actually working for the Russians, say, um, our job would be to go undercover and investigate them and see if if it was true that they, that they were. We never found anyone that was, but we did do a number of undercover investigations. So it was... I, look, I, I was incredibly lucky to get it. I actually enlisted at 11 Bravo, what they call 11 Bang Bang. It's just an infantry soldier. I did that because there was a $5,000 signing bonus, which was a lot of money back in Ooh. the 1980s. Uh, but then I did well on the tests and stuff. So they I, they didn't recruit me. That would be that would that would overstate it. But they had a quota to fill. I met the quota. So they yanked me out of the infantry and put me in counterintelligence, which which was awesome. Best thing that ever could have happened to me. Oh, that's seriously awesome. Like, I'm kind of curious. Like, I like that is kind of mine right now, especially with everything with like, the Soviet Union back in the 80s and Russia and Ukraine war going on right now. Like, how do you kind of like from your personal experience being in the military and everything, like how does like how do you kind of feel about their like Ukraine Russian war type of thing? Like, well, so the, the so let's get philosophical to answer a question like that. So, so what is war, right? First off, war is pretty awful. Um, mm -hmm. and it's, it, war, war is, I think that there's a very famous saying that I'm going to forget, uh, but it's something like, you know, it's, it, war is the last vestige of politics, right? So everything else mm -hmm. has failed. So you resort to fighting. Um, and the, I think there's in today's world, and I, I would even argue the eighties were a little different. We've, we've matured because of the internet and the ability to communicate mm -hmm. now. Um, the idea to me, the idea of a military conflict seems unnecessary uh, mm. now if if you're being attacked you know if, if you're on the ukraine side and all of a sudden there's russian troops inside your border you can argue that you have the right to defend yourself so i'm not saying they don't have the right to defend themselves but um but the any conflict i think is is, is unnecessary and I, I think there are ways around it so i don't fully understand it i guess that'd be the best way yeah. for me to put it I, I i keep up on the news i'm not too into the news anymore because uh it's hard to listen to some of it and all that but um uh, i think that that generally speaking those types of conflicts uh I, I don't i don't understand what it is that people in their lives when they get up that morning and they think now nah, today's the day we're gonna nuke them you know let's go and i mean how many people have died in that thing hundreds mm -hmm. of thousands right yeah for what for on either side for what uh and, you know so you know and and now that's an easy position to take because no one's shooting at me right and no and I, I get to go to sleep and i feel pretty safe when i sleep so that, that's a philosophical statement but it's where i am you know if they, i live in florida if, if someone if, if uh, someone invaded florida i probably would have a different um a different view of war or whatever but but for this one i just think i i think that there there probably were ways to prevent it and there probably are ways to stop it and i just don't understand why we let it go on Mm, I know right it's just like I know like what you said earlier like back then like to today's world in 2023 we didn't like they like back then you guys didn't have that technology to kind of be able didn't. to like figure out like oh what's going on at this moment was it say Russia or Ukraine or especially our home country of the United States like what's going on and that's like crazy with the internet these days that, like you can always look up let's just say like today's president of the united states for example and they can say like oh what what happened in today's world what did he say what did he do like what's going on in this country like it's like you'll like find access to basically everything you will want to hear or see especially in you know what's interesting and you asked me the question so you you get you get to hear my answer yeah. um in the olden days let's say the olden days i'm sure there were agendas and all of that stuff but the news it was it was late so you would find out what happened days or weeks later now you find out minutes or seconds later mm -hmm. but there was it was generally geared towards informing you about what was going on now today i don't know a news source to go to where i don't have to first decide what political view i want and mm -hmm. then i find the political view i want and then i go to that and then i go and look at the news through that lens um, I don't know a place where that's not the truth. Uh, that, that It's all news organizations that I know. And it, I find it frustrating because no matter what side of this thing you're on, everything now is filtered and spun and it's trying to make another point, which it is 
how do you so how do you know how do you how do you ground yourself and so what you have to do is you have to decide on the politics of it first and then listen to the news where it used to be you'd go listen to the news and see what was going on and then make a decision politically on how you felt about it or whatever so it's backwards it's been turned around um mm -hmm. and for me because i grew up in the other system it's like nails on a chalkboard i find i find just you know keeping up with what's going on very difficult i don't know kylie for someone who like you who's only come up in this system i don't know what, what do you think of it what how do you get news like especially like social media especially being a teenager and growing up with social media like you like especially like with like big social media apps like tiktok facebook instagram yeah. Twitter, well, X now, but well, like as we firmly know as Twitter, but yeah. like, or even watching like news, for example, like I, like, I always, I don't know, like people might find it weird for a 16 year old watching news all the time. I do, but it's even well, like, good. for me as a 16 year old. I think you're a squared away kid, by the way. So thank you. It's, I'm but glad even, that you watch the news. Thank you. Even if it's like a 16 year old, like, like you said earlier, it's hard to watch news at some point. It's, yeah. Of course, with the watching, whether it's like, something live on tv or just reading through articles um on google or something it's sometimes it's very hard to read like sometimes i'll read through um what's a T tmz i'll read through their articles like i'll read through fox news i read like i read everything that's you know like that, what's going on because if i'm like curious about like something that's going on whether it's like entertainment politics sports I'll go to sources that I'm kind of am familiar with as a person or as a journalist I'm mostly familiar with. But it's like especially growing up with social media and as a 16 year old, like all we know as Gen Z people is social media. Like all of, like especially you will see everything on social media. And yeah. so like, like especially nowadays, like it will take minutes for things to come out. Like it'll take yeah. like literally minutes, and like back then, you guys well probably had to wait weeks or like day, days, certainly days. I mean, it wasn't it wasn't the stone. I wasn't looking for smoke signals, um, mm -hmm. but uh, yeah, no. But it was, I mean, like like for example, when I was in Panama, in Fort Myers, in Florida, so I subscribed to the Fort Myers paper, and every week they would mail me the prior week's papers. So yeah, so in that case, my news was between three and ten days old, my local news for where I you know where I lived and stuff. Um, so yeah, I find that. So now you mentioned you're a, 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 what do you, a Gen Z. Mm -hmm. Is that, how, how do you know you're a Gen Z? How well, do you know basically, that? based they off help? my age, basically. Is that, but, but, but I mean, yeah. So I mean, but, so I guess all the, all your social media feeds and stuff kind of categorize you and that's how you now have to uh, see that's to me, that's terrible. I hate that. I hate that. I, I'm very lucky. I was born after the boomers i'm like i'm like in a little tiny window so i'm not a boomer but i'm not i don't even know what came next whatever came next i'm not that either so i'm i'm not you know i'm not in any group but uh yeah everything we do now is we put ourselves in these buckets everything's a bucket and then everything's they call they call it tribal right so we all have to think the same if you're in that bucket or whatever so um yeah i don't i don't know so if you're a, a gen z what does that mean what's a gen z mean like Gen honestly, Z. I'm like gonna be genie. quite honest with you. I have no clue. <laughs> I swear, I have no clue. Like I just like I don't, I just know like so with social media is just like they post things that make you believe that you're part of Gen Z or more little more yeah. or part of this yeah. like thing because of, like your age or when you're what year you're born or like what type of group are you in. They may kind of social media makes me believe like you're part of this group based off your age or who you follow that's I, which is which is terrible i i view the internet although i make I earn my living on the internet i mean just like you're doing this on the internet mm -hmm. I, all all the stuff all the stuff i do I, I use the internet so it's good for some things but from a social standpoint um i just i wonder if it's if it's uh you know really as good i mean especially if you're a gen z but you don't know what it means, but that's a label that's been applied to you, right? It's got nothing to do with you, nothing to do with you. Uh, but anyway, I, I mean, I'll, I'll soapbox, the danger is I'll soapbox on a lot of stuff. So I don't wanna, I don't wanna soapbox on that. But, and, and by the way, what you're doing with the news is right. The only thing I'll, I'll suggest also, uh, and it sounds like you go to a variety of sources, which is good. None of it's real. Denzel Washington Ooh. said, uh, if you don't watch the news, you're uninformed. If you do watch the news, you're misinformed. Mm -hmm. uh, so what I do, uh, which, um 
I would suggest, it seems like good ways, not only read what they're telling you, but always ask yourself, why? Why are they telling me this particular thing compared to something else? And that mm -hmm. might at least help um, you get the bigger picture of what's really going on. So. Yeah, because I know like with a lot of like news stories, I, I'm not speaking for every every like news station, but I know like with like most news stations, whether it's like your local news station or like the like a thing that covers basically everyone, like like a big news station, is that like I think they're probably the most important mission on their end is probably like oh what's gonna basically get like viewers pissed yeah. or they're, like the companies they're, they're making money that so all they do and that's what, and it's this is because of the internet and everything. Um, and it was always true, but not to this degree. But yeah, so what they want to do is get you to click on something so they can bring a page up and they don't care what's on the page. They want to sell the advertising that's around the page, right? That, that's on the top or the bottom of the banners and all that stuff. And then they make money. So the more stuff they can get you to click on, the more scrolls they can do and all that stuff. Uh, that's what they're feeding you. And if it's based on something real, that's great. If it's not, they don't care. They're, they still make their money. So they're all big corporations now. And you now, what what do you it, are you going to go work for a corporation? Is that your is that your goal in life? What do you want to What do you do? Like I definitely do want to be like a journalist. Like okay. I'm not sure if I want to go into like a big corporation, whether it's like a big news outlet. I'm not sure like if I want to go whether it's like sports, for example, or entertainment politics. I have no idea. But I do. My biggest goal is to definitely whether it's like working on like a media station locally sure. or like a big local station. And it all depends how what life takes me because you have no idea until like the opportunities just get thrown at you. Well, that's the thing. Yeah. Our, our, the other thing, our society it was true for me too, which is you have to pick who you want to be before you have any clue what any of it means. Right. Mm -hmm. And, and, and if you don't pick, yeah, then you wind up potentially in something that you don't like. So it's, uh, it's, it's, it's kind of backwards, you know, really. Mm -hmm. But um, I, I think, look, I think it's, I, we, we need a new generation of people who can go back and just report stuff, right? Mm. Don't worry about what I think of it. Just tell me the truth. That that's mm. that's what that's what I want. I'm selfishly that's what I want from news. So I'm gonna have to now follow you when you get your reporting assignments, and uh, um, hopefully you'll be one of those down the middle facts rule kind of reporters. Let's hope so. Let's that hope so. My confidence there. Let's hope so. Yeah. But um. As you kind of switch topics a bit, like how, what was kind of like your role like as a special agent in the U.S. Army? Like, what did it kind of look like for you? Well, so in Panama, I lived uh, on a base called Corazal, which was kind of not that great a, not that great a base. Um, and we were in what you would consider like dorms, like college dorms. And uh, we, I had, so I, I had a foot in both worlds. I had a foot in the military world. So we had to get up every morning at 4 a.m. And we had to go run three to five miles and do PT and all that stuff, um, you know, army stuff. Uh, and then I would come back and I'd have breakfast in the mess hall. Uh, it was free. All the food was free, which is a really good deal, by the way. Mm -hmm. uh, and then I would dress and not in the, most days, not in a uniform, but in a suit. And we had these little Toyota um, uh, cars. I don't even know what they're called. Sedans, I guess, but they're little. And then we would go to an office building on the Air Force Base. And then it looked, that part of it looked like a job, like like any job you see, um, to, you know, today. Uh, and then we would do that. And then at lunch, we would take off. We'd have to go back to the base, change into our fatigues and do some kind of detail. And then we'd come and do the afternoon. And we just did that every day. And mo I got most, most weekends I got off. Um, and it was just kind of a job. Now, when we invaded, when I was, I, I, I was, uh, when we invaded Panama, it was different. And then I spent six months at the Soto Cano Air Base in Honduras. And I don't remember, have you ever heard of a thing called Iran-Contra? Does that name ring a bell? It's old. It was and a big that, deal I'm for me. I'm not sure. Maybe it does. Maybe I just not think about it at the top of my head, though. Yeah, Ali North and, and everything. This It turns out, I didn't know this at the time, but I was right there. I was there in the middle of this. And what uh, Iran-Contra was is a little complicated, but they were selling arms into Nicaragua to raise money for something with Iran hostages or something. It's really confusing. But this Soto Cano Air Base in Honduras is where they were running the arms through. And I saw some of it. I had no clue what it was. My, my mission there, when I was there, what we were doing is uh, Pablo Escobar's was flying cocaine up in DC-9s from Honduras into Texas and New Mexico. And he was refueling in uh, Honduras. So what we would do is we'd get tips when they were coming in. And my job was to drive the Jeep. And I, I would uh, drive the Jeep. And we were working with the DEA. And there were FBI guys there, too, which I never understood because I didn't think the FBI was supposed to work 
outside the border, but whatever. And then I would drive the Jeep and we'd go up when the planes landed and we'd, uh, you know, confiscate them and arrest the people. Um, and that was because this was all during uh, the war on drugs and all kinds of 80s stuff. Um, so that was that was different. That was, you know, you're living basically in a tent. It's not quite a tent, but it's not a building either. Uh, and it's a very rugged existence. Uh, I did that for six months. And then I came back to the States. I was at Fort Monmouth for uh, three, four months. And then I then I out processed. And Fort Monmouth is in New Jersey. That's interesting. Like, like, especially with like, like you, like, like, were you like there, like during like when that whole stuff, I know you said you were there, but like, where did you kind of see that, like a bunch of that stuff, like with the evasion kind of happen or were you just like, kind of like, oh, I'm just hearing stuff from people. During... The, inv the invasion, the Panama yeah. invasion. Yeah. Oh, no. Oh, yeah. Oh, in fact, I was my so my job during the invasion was I was with the I, I think it was the second it was the 111th Infantry. I was attached to them because they were attacking the Commandancia, which was the equivalent of their Pentagon. And my job, I wasn't the frontline guy, even though I, I wound up being very close to the front line. But we took the building and I was with them. And my job was then to inventory and confiscate in, intelligence assets. So, you know, if if an enemy broke into the Pentagon, there'd be lots of stuff they were interested in. And that was the same way for us. So I went in uh, with the 111th uh, Infantry. We took the Commandancia. I took all, I, you know, I I got a bunch of intel, brought it back. And then I was on the, the document retrieval team because uh, uh, Noyega worked for some from his house and all kinds of stuff. And so we, had to, we went around for the, like that week and we were basically confiscating intelligence documents. When I was done with that, I was at the processing center. So we had all the refugees and all the people we had uh, uh, captured. And I was part of the interrogation team. I didn't interrogate. I didn't speak Spanish well enough to interrogate anybody, but I kind of ran the pen where they were. And I made sure that no one got out of line or escaped or killed me or any of that stuff. Ooh, that's interesting. And I kind of want, before we head up, I wanted to ask you, like, did you write Panama, Panama Red after you like were stationed there? Or did you kind of write it like when you're currently stationed at that moment? I wrote Panama Red two years ago two and a half years ago. Uh, so it's very, it's very much an old guy remembering the good old days. Uh, although the book, it's not, it's not a memoir by any stretch. It's a thriller. And I just based it on uh, a number of the uh, skirmishes and the events and the different things. So for example, we had a guy, he was captured by the PDF. So in like um, October to December, 89, things kind of fell apart. And, and there was a guy who was in the laundromat and the, the PDF was the Panamanian Defense Force. It was the, it's both the police force and the military of Panama. And they arrested this guy and we had to go get him from a PDF substation. So like that's in the book. It's, it's not told that way, but like those events are in the book. When I went into the Dorian Gap and stayed with the Wagandi Indians and stuff, that's in the book. Again, it's not a memoir of what I did, but I based what I did. I, you know, I use, you know, they say, write what you know. So I use those experiences to make the book very real. And the feedback I do get very consistently in the book is that there's just uh, more of that book than any other thing I've, I've written is there is a, a sense of authenticity, uh, you know, to, to the events and stuff that are going on. Mm -hmm. Like, how did you kind of like bring like your, I know like you said it was like kind of like a thriller, but I added some things to kind of like make it like, not say interesting, but just like make it like a good read to make it seem like real type of thing. Like, yeah. how did you kind of, like, make, like, your, like, experiences and everything into that book, even though you didn't want to kind of make it, let's say, like, a memoir type of thing? Yeah. Like, how did you kind of put those, like, thriller and, like, your experiences kind of together? That That's that's a good question. And, and I actually thought about this a lot. So what I did is I made up a fake bad guy, and I had the bad guy orchestrating events um, that led to all of the different action scenes and, and you know, conflict in the book. Uh, so, so yeah, so, so the bad guy in the book, uh, it's actually a woman, her name's Kimberly Sharp. She's an ex, uh, uh, Mexican air force officer and she's a, a bad dude. And, um, you know, she's kind of driving things and controlling things. And then the main character, Dirk, uh, you know, he is kind of at the whim of this and figuring it out and, you know, fighting his way through it. Uh, so yeah, so the story, she drives the narrative of the story, which is made up. It's just a thriller, like a, like a good one, I, I think. Um, but then as stuff had to happen, I drew from my personal experiences to make the action more real. Um, and it seemed to, have, it, it worked pretty well. The, the, in the next book, which you can't see, Drive Faster, mm -hmm. I did less of that, but still some of it. 
and people pick up on that. And then the rest of the books are more just made up thrillers. There's, there's still a lot of military, you know, I was in it for a while. So that, you know, the, there's military foundation, but they're, they're more made up. But yeah, Panama Red and then a little bit of Drive Faster are, uh, the, yeah, the, the action is, could, could have been a memoir, just the context of it would have been very different. Ooh, gotcha. And like, I like love everything like you're basically doing. I don't want to like go and figure out much time. I know I'm running, running out of time, but thank you um for everything you're doing. I know I had to introduce my uncle to your books. So you see, um, he's basically very interested in those that kind of not military, but he's basically like a big like history type of person. So I have to introduce him to like your books and everything. And um, and just seeing that. Just so you know, I've got almost all my books are free at this point. The Kindle version oh, really? is free. Yeah, so you just go on Amazon. It's free. Panama Red is a big one. You know, there's hundreds and hundreds of reviews. And it seems to be a pe book people like. So, yeah, if you're interested, it won't cost you anything but time. And I think it's time well spent. So, Ooh, yeah. Perfect. Absolutely. I definitely, definitely probably buy the Panama book later on tonight to get it. <laughs> Maybe for a Christmas present. Got yeah. it. Okay. But yeah, yeah. um, thank you so much, David, for coming on and taking the time. I appreciate so much your work. It's just absolutely amazing. And um, thank you for coming on and sharing your story. I know like it's much appreciated, and hope everyone took in as much knowledge as they could. And I really appreciate you taking the time. Well, look, Kylie, you, you keep doing what you're doing too, because uh, what you're doing is just as important as anything I've ever done. Um, and we need people like you because you're gonna run this place in ten years. Uh, so uh, I'm rooting for you. Keep Thank doing you. it. Thank you. Maybe future president of the United States. Just kidding. Yeah. <laughs> I'll vote for you as long as I like your policies. <laughs> Who knows? Yeah. Good. <laughs> but um, yeah, thank you so much, everyone, for listening. I hope everyone has a great day. And thank you, David, again. I hope you have a great rest of your day. Thank you. Yep.